three crucial areas of tax that we all have to understand. What are the subjects we're going to talk about? Well, three tax planning issues and really what you need to know about them. So we're going to start talking about capital gains taxes and how to avoid them. I think that's the key, how to avoid them. We're going to talk about property taxes and Prop 19. And if you follow our talks, we talk about this a lot. That's because we know that most people in California who are going to be affected by this don't understand it. We're going to talk about what you can do to avoid massive property tax increases. Again, it might be redundant for some of you, but we need to know and spread the word about that. We're going to talk about estate and gift taxes and right why it may not be an issue now, but they can become much more difficult and challenging in just a couple of years. Well, they almost certainly will. There's a cliff coming. And we'll, of course, talk about action steps and what you can do. Capital gains taxes. Mistakes can cost your family hundreds of thousands of dollars. Here's what you need to know. The key terminology, of course, uh, focuses first on cost basis. So the price you pay for an asset, the price you pay for a share of stock, the price you pay for a piece of real property, that's the cost basis. And to keep it simple, if you sell it for more than you paid for it, the difference between what you get and the basis, what you pay, is profit. That's capital gain. That's where you have to pay capital gains tax. If and only if you sell the asset. If you don't sell, capital gains tax does not come up. In capital gains tax the world, if you own something and you sell it in under a year, that's a short-term capital gain. And that's typically just taxes income. So if you bought a stock, you sell it in under a year, any profit you made is just added to your taxable income. And that's usually a punishing tax rate. Now, if you hold it for more than a year, we have long-term capital gains tax rates. And those are typically lower than income taxes. And in California, though, it can still be around 30 or even sometimes over 30%. So you might lose 30% of your gain, even for a long-term capital gain. If it's short-term, you might lose 40 or 50% of your profit. So yeah, what does this mean? If you're in California, at least if you're a high earner, it could be a third of your gain could be lost to the IRS unless you plan. Four key concepts. So one is the stepped up basis after death. Two, when you sell your residence, there's a capital gains tax exclusion that really anybody can take advantage of. Three, 1031 exchanges if you have a rental property or commercial property. And then four, another key concept is charitable remainder trusts. Let's now talk about the stepped up basis, or as I like to call it, the, the get out of jail free card. Now it comes at a cost. Someone has to pass away for this. So again, basis, price you paid. If you bought the asset and you sell the asset, you have the capital gain. You have to pay the capital gains tax. Upon your passing, if and only if the asset is in your estate, and it usually is, then we get this thing called the stepped up basis, which means the basis, regardless of the price you paid, increases to reflect the market value of the asset on the date of your death. So if you paid $400,000 for your house, that's the cost basis. Now it's worth $3 million. If you sell it before you pass away, before the first death, massive capital gains up. At the first death, if you're a couple, the basis goes up, it steps up to reflect the market value. The new basis becomes $3 million. If the surviving spouse then wants to sell it for $3 million, Sell it for three, subtract the new basis of three, zero gain, no tax. The structure of your trust for a married couple affects the calculation of the stepped up basis. At the first death, whether you have this thing called an AB trust or not, the structure of your revocable trust for a couple is directly impacted by the analysis about cost basis. Because the first death for community property, everything gets the stepped up basis. Stock, real property, everything. At the second death, if you have what is generically called an AB trust, only half of the assets get another stepped up basis. There's yeah. an alternative structure to the trust that allows for a second stepped up basis for everything. So where a little time has gone by since you created your trust, it's always worth it to take a fresh look at the structure and make sure it makes sense. Because again, getting a second stepped up basis can save a small fortune in capital gains tax. And I think one, your residence. When you sell your house, if it's your residence and you've lived there for at least two of the last five years, the, if you're single, the first $250,000 in gains is not taxed. So if you bought your house for $500,000, you're single, you sell it two years later for $750,000, that's a $250,000 gain, but you pay zero capital gains tax. You only have to pay capital gains tax if you sell it for more than that. One tip is if you are in a long-term relationship with someone, you live in the house together, well, if you get married and you add your significant other to the title, 
All of a sudden, you just doubled that to five hundred thousand. Let's say you own two properties, and one's a rental, and one's a house, but you want to sell one in a couple of years. Well, maybe you move into that one and make that your residence. And there's other ways you can make something your residence without necessarily living there full time. Um, and then all of a sudden, you get this five hundred thousand if you're a couple or two hundred fifty thousand dollar exemption. So now let's talk about rentals. So ten thirty one exchanges, and I, I have the term "kick the can." until you're gone. If you own a rental property or a commercial property that's generating income, you can do what's known as a 1031 exchange. So if you sell a rental property, you know, if, if you have a big gain, there's no homeowner's exemption. There's no two hundred fifty dollars or $500,000 exemption. If you don't live there, by definition, you don't get that. So let's say you own a duplex or a fourplex. If it goes up in value, whatever that increase in value is, when you sell it versus what you bought it for, you can move a third of that to the IRS unless you do a 1031 exchange. Now, a 1031 exchange tax code that allows for like-kind exchanges. So if you're selling an income property and you buy another income property with it and you follow the right steps, you need to set this up before you sell. You need to get the process going. You don't have to pay capital gains taxes. Now, you do have to buy other real estate for similar value. But let's say you have a fourplex that's worth $2 million and you bought it for $500,000 years ago. If you sold it and just took the cash, you could pay $500,000 in capital gains taxes. If instead you take that and you put into another real estate investment that qualifies, you pay zero capital gains taxes. Now, that new real estate investment carries your old cost basis over. So if you ever sell that, you would still have that huge capital gains tax issue. So let's say you own a property that's very um, high maintenance and you're, you're dealing with tenants and you want to get out of the tenant management business. Well, you can sell and buy into a larger real estate investment where maybe you have no management. Role. But it's a way to change your investment uh, without taking that capital gains tax hit. And I mentioned kick the can down the road. This is why a lot of real estate families end up with extraordinary wealth. You do 1031 exchanges nonstop and you can trade into other properties. It can be higher value, lower value. You build up cash flow. And then when one parent passes away, you get the stepped up basis. And all of a sudden, if the family wants to cash out, they can because they kept that was, avoiding, that was avoiding, the can, avoiding. That was the can that was kicked down the road. <laughs> yeah, there you go. They kicked the can down the road. I like that. Let's say you want to sell your residence and it's it's gone up more than, than $500,000. So you'd face significant capital gains tax exposure. Hey, maybe you consider converting that to a rental before you sell it. Maybe you rent your house out for a year and a half, two years. Yes, you have to wait a little bit, but then all of a sudden, maybe you can sell it and not take a $400,000, $500,000, $600,000 capital gains tax hit and put all that money to work for your family. But let's talk about stocks and some of the tools available there and a charitable remainder trust. So let's say you have some uh, stock, uh, by the way, or it could be real property that you bought many years ago, an asset that has appreciated hugely in value. But maybe that asset is not giving you much income. You'd like to have more income. You may or may not have a charity you want to support. Let's say you have $500,000 worth of stock for which your cost basis is $5,000. And we see that around here. So if they were to sell, they would have that massive capital gains tax. And then they'd reinvest the money that they netted after paying tax. And then they'd create an income stream for themselves. So the alternative is we create a charitable remainder trust. The stock is transferred into the trust. The trust sells the stock. Now, because upon the death of the beneficiaries, mom and dad, because that money is all going to go to a tax exempt organization, there's no capital gains tax. We're avoiding all of the income and capital gains tax implications. So if it sells for 2 million, capital gains tax might've been massive, but the 2 million is then invested and gives you a rate of return. We set the rate of return. It can set, you can say 5% of the value of the assets in the charitable trust comes back to you annually as a distribution for the rest of your life. So you're turning an illiquid asset into an investment with no capital gains tax exposure to dramatically increase your level of income at, for the rest of your life. Many nuances here. You can choose the yeah. you choose the charity that ultimately gets the money. Many individuals use the extra income that they didn't have before as a result of the charitable remainder trust. They take that extra income and they buy a life insurance policy and they put it into an insurance trust. Again, second level of planning, but that's yes. a way of replacing the wealth that is now not going to go to your kids because it's going to go to the charity. So CRTs are a very creative, available, workable approach to sell assets without capital gains tax exposure and to create income for life. If it's been a long time since you looked at your trust structure, we need to take a fresh look at, at what you have. Because Mike mentioned that crucial issue of the stepped up basis when you pass away. And long story short, if you had an AV trust from a long time ago, 
it might not make sense anymore, partially because the split means that when the second spouse passes away, a big chunk of your estate might not get that step up in basis and it might not serve any other purposes. But if you haven't looked at your trust for a while, there's someone you know, and they set up a trust many years ago, let's take a fresh look. And also before you sell real estate, we gave a lot of tips around that. We're not realtors. We, we don't really have any stake in this. We just want to give you great advice and we want to make sure that your plan is integrated. So talk to us before you sell real estate. So we can just think through these strategies. And of course, let's make sure your estate plan is up to date. I hope these tips on capital gains tax were super helpful. Leave comments, questions. Uh, if you're watching this recording, like the video, property taxes and Prop 19. Even if your child lives in your home after you pass away, if you own your house for a long time, protections are gutted. There, there are minimal protections from massive increases in property taxes. It used to be that you could pass your primary residence to your kids and it didn't matter if they lived there or not, it didn't matter how much your house was worth, property taxes didn't go up at all as long as it was your primary residence. And Prop 19 gutted that. And if you have any other property, if you're lucky enough to own uh, a rental or a vacation cabin or whatever, zero protections from reassessment for those when it goes to your kids. So in many cases, this forces a sale, which by the way, was why this law passed because uh, the Realtors Association put, I think, $35 million um, into the campaign to pass this because they knew there'd be a lot more sales of real estate when people see their new tax bills. Your primary residence, there's a simple test now. When you pass away, if you leave your primary residence to your kids, if they live in it and they move in within a year of your passing, the first $1 million in fair market value is protected from a reassessment, but in fair market value beyond the assessed value is protected. And that's only if your kids live there. If they do not live in the house, there are no protections from a property tax reassessment. So that the property tax would be fully reassessed at whatever the house is worth when you pass away, even if that's 30 times higher than the current property tax base. All other property, business property, vacation property, rental property, full reassessment. We have tools that can prevent this. We got a, a call from a woman, her name was Sarah, um, and, and Sarah had just inherited a house from her father. It was a house her father had built. It was in Mountain View. Uh, literally built most of it with his his, his own hands um, and, and bought the land decades ago and built most of the house. He had some additional help. But the bottom line is the house, just the land alone, was worth over $3 million. But the property tax base, because Prop 13 kept it low, was under $200,000, maybe it was $300,000. Prop 13 limits increases in annual property taxes to 2%. So if you own a property for decades and decades, the assessed value, the one used for property tax purposes, is obviously much, much lower than the fair market value. So Sarah inherited the house from her father. He passed away. That was really the bulk of what he was able to leave her. She wanted to live in the house. And she thought that kids were protected from property tax increases. She was rudely surprised when she got a supplemental tax bill that said that she owed another $25,000 in taxes that year for the first year of property taxes. Why? Because only the first $1 million in fair market values protected beyond the assessed value. So in her case, let's say the assessed value is $300,000. Okay, she lives there. The protection is $1 million beyond that. So the first 1.3 million of the house's fair market value was protected from a reassessment, but the house is worth over 3 million. So the county said, okay, we're gonna give you that million dollars in protection. By the way, the house is worth another $2 million beyond that, pay us $24,000 every year in perpetuity. We talked to her, it was too late to do anything. Once they go up, you cannot get them to come back down. You gotta plan ahead for this. This is basically the example I just gave. $3.3 million home with a $300,000 assessed value. What happens to property taxes if a family plans and keeps the taxes low versus if they don't plan, as in Sarah's case? Let's say that the home's value is 3.3 million and a child lives there. So they should get that some of that protection. What happens to property taxes? They go up from $3,300 a year to over $25,000 a year. That's the child's living in the house. So over 10 years, that's $240,000 in extra property taxes. In 30 years, that's almost $900,000 in property taxes she would have to earn about an extra 1.1, 1.2 million dollars to pay the extra property taxes. If they worked with us, we could have protected it. Let me give the same example, a $3.3 million home, $300,000 assessed value for dad. He leaves it to his daughter, but she decides not to live there. She wants to keep it as a rental. The numbers are even worse. The property taxes go from $3,300 a year to over $36,000 a year. And over time, almost $1.35 million in extra property taxes. But we can prevent it if we if we act ahead of time. For rentals, there are zero protections. You don't even get that first million dollars in protections that you do for a, for a home. Let's say you want to leave a rental to support your child with special needs or support your child who just has issues earning money or to let them stay in the area after you're gone. Zero protections unless you plan ahead. We do have solutions for this. We can protect rental properties 
from, from having a reassessment when you pass away. We can keep it low. But if you don't plan ahead, taxes can spike. And again, let's say it's a $2 million you know, fourplex that you've had in the family for a long time. The assessed value is $200,000. If you don't plan ahead, property taxes when you pass away or when you leave it to your kids or give it to your kids would go up to about $20,000, $22,000 a year. Over time, that's $800,000 over 30 years in extra taxes. You know, it might not be um, even worth keeping. And that's, again, that's why people sell. So remember, you only have one residence. If you have a cabin in the mountains that you want to keep, in this context, it's the same analysis as the rental. No exceptions, complete reassessment. We want to earn more rather than save. Like we're geared, if you if you find an opportunity to earn an extra twenty or $30,000 a year, you're like, oh, great. If I don't have to do much work for that, that's amazing. But if you can save twenty or $30,000 a year, it's it's hard to wrap your head around it. And ironically, saving the twenty or $30,000 in taxes is more powerful than earning an extra twenty or $30,000 because you have to pay. It's, it's what you don't have to pay. Because again, to pay twenty thousand in taxes, you probably have to earn thirty thousand. Because you get hit on income taxes, and you don't get to deduct all of your property taxes. So, you know, I want to reframe how we think about this. Saving twenty thousand is actually probably worth more than that per year to your family. And if they buy a replacement property, let's say your kids inherit, we talked about that in a stepped up basis. They could sell property from if they if you plan right for no capital gains taxes. But then if they want to buy a replacement, even for less. They're going to have super high property taxes for that because it's going to be reassessed at whatever value they buy it at. And if they want to move out of state, by the way, Texas, Florida, all these supposedly low tax states, they have super high property taxes. You know, again, just let's imagine what's possible when all you've worked for is saved for the next generation. And what is our solution? Well, we've developed the Gilfix in the Pole Dynasty LLC process. We can keep property taxes low. And we can still, if it makes sense, get that stepped up basis, giving your kids the option of holding on to property with low property taxes or selling without capital gains tax exposure. So a lot of people are taking steps that we don't think are wise. Maybe they're they're finding ways to transfer properties to their kids, maybe limiting the property tax increase. But if they do that the wrong way, you lose the stepped up basis. So we have to be aware of that. We have to be aware of <clears throat> estate tax issues um, and a number of other issues. So that's property tax, Prop 19, and our solution for that. So contact us if you have questions. We can very quickly go through what the numbers are for you and your family and how we can work with you to develop a solution. Anybody in, from San Diego to Wairica, if, if you own properties in California, we can help with this. Let's talk about some of these key rules about estate and gift taxes. The current numbers in 2022, uh, you could pass 12.06 million. And now in 2023, Everybody can pass via gift or bequest $12.92 million per person. So that's a, that's a big number. For a couple, that's almost $26 million you can give away or, or give to your heirs when you pass away without any estate tax exposure. Um, now, anything over that is taxed at a punishing 40% rate. It only affects one in about 1,000, one in 500 to one in 1,000 American families right now. It doesn't affect many. You can also give $17,000 a year to as many people as you'd like without even reporting it to the IRS. That's the gift exemption. And if it's a couple, that's $34,000 to as many people as you want. No tax forms are required. If you have a, a smaller estate, maybe you're not worried about that, or maybe you have a moderate to, to decent size estate, but you're like, I'm not, I'm not 20 million. I don't need to think about that. Wrong. So let's talk about what's about to happen. Currently, very high level of protection. Very, very, very few are exposed. Again, a couple, 25 million is protected. It's not going to last. January 1, 2026, the law changes really rather dramatically. Rather than about 13 million that can be passed along by an individual without the 40% estate tax, it's going to be about 6.5 million, cut in half. Individuals with larger estates and most couples just have to look at objectively at what you have. And if you're anywhere near 13 million as a couple, your estate's going to grow in value. The level of estate tax protection is coming down. So we just have to be aware that Today's numbers are not your numbers. The issue is very real. So if you're, if you're a single person and the estate's over 5 million, and by the way, the state includes your life insurance, your retirement accounts, real property in other states. So if you're single and the estate's over 5 million, we're going to assume a degree of growth. We're going to assume that you're going to have exposure to the estate tax if you're a couple and it's 10 million. Will your estate grow to 13, 14 million over the next 10, 15 years? Yes. So you just have to think proactively. You have to be aware of what all of these options are. Your home alone, one piece of real property can do it around here. Well, and, and so, so many homes are, yeah, are maybe two to three million 
But then you add your life insurance benefits and your retirement accounts and your investment accounts. And you might not, and we have a lot of clients in this boat. Like we don't feel wealthy at all. They're five, six, $7 million net worth because they have assets. So currently not that many people face the issue, but in the future, many will. There are so many options. Uh, we have a book that we've authored that I've authored uh, called Beat Estate Tax Forever that's available. We identify many strategies and techniques to dramatically reduce estate tax exposure. Mark mentioned the thirty, the $17,000 annual exclusion. Certainly you can take liberal creative use of that. There are LLCs, there are family partnerships, there are ways of transferring property where we discount the value of a gift. If you give away a house worth a million dollars to somebody, that gift is worth a million dollars because you gave them the entire property. If you give them, for example, a 50% interest, is that worth $500,000? Mathematically it is, but because the recipient is only going to have a 50% interest, they can't sell the property without you, they can't take out a mortgage without you, the value of a partial interest is restricted, it's limited. I mean, our job is to reduce or eliminate estate tax for those who have exposure. So I call this trust the grandparents' delight. There are many things that a parent or a grandparent can do to support and make life a little bit better for a grandchild. You can set up 529 plans for the cost of education, but I like the crummy trust. And the reason I do is it's a tool that lets you use the $17,000 annual exclusion at minimum to fund a trust for the benefit of a grandchild. So the idea here is a couple is putting up to $34,000 a year into this trust. This money is in that trust and under the control of a trustee as long as you like. You can set the terms. You can say this trust is going to last for my grandchild until he's 35. In the meantime, his parent is going to be the trustee and is going to manage that money. And rather than just to pay the cost of education, it can be for health care. It can be for housing very liberal in terms of how we can write that trust. It can really add up. I mean, it could be hundreds, well, hundreds of thousands of dollars thousands over time, time. tax-free. It's kind of a use it or lose it type of situation. If the exemption should drop January 1st, 2026, if you don't take advantage of these higher exemptions before then, you lose them forever. Uh, we did uh, another webinar called uh, Next Level Estate Planning for High Net Worth Families. We're into this in more detail. It's on the channel. But most importantly, and we have an image of Mike's book here, Beat Estate Tax Forever. It's available on Amazon. And I hope this gave you kind of an overview that January 1st, 2026 is a crucial date. That's when the exemption is set to drop. We want you to imagine what's possible when we plan together. And we love being a part of your team. Share this with others. Easy to contact us guildfix.com 650-493-8070. So it's very easy to find us. We, we treasure having you guys as part of our community. And we hope everybody, as my mom likes to say, is saying safe, sane, and healthy. And we hope to see you soon.